There's a play on the edge of obscurity that you should never read. It's authorless, translated by unknown scholars, with most copies seized by the French government, whilst being confiscated and destroyed by others. A play which even the greatest literary anarchists have stripped and censored. Though this play does not in any way violate any grand moral principle or upset any convictions. Its first act is, in fact, an unoriginal and rote piece of theater. An opulent kingdom, a pallid and unearthly messenger in a grand costumed ball with an unmasking that twists the stomach. <laughs> you, sir, should unmask. Indeed? Indeed, it's time. We all have laid aside disguise but you. I wear no mask. No mask? No mask? The first act ends with a bitter cry before it slides into its second. The reason for its infamy. The second act's tragic and destructive nature obsesses, seduces, and decays the mind of all those who read it. A terrible, twisting tale of a doomed kingdom that spreads from mind to mind, from theater to theater, destroying persona and life alike. It's called The King in Yellow. The only problem is, this play isn't real. It exists within another story, or set of stories, this time not authorless, but conceived by American weird fiction writer Robert W. Chambers. His King in Yellow resembles a jumbled collection of script excerpts, short stories, and cryptic poetics. The destructive play itself appears throughout the stories, spreading irreality and madness in its wake. In the short story, The Yellow Sign, a playful discussion of the script's theme and meaning turns to indulgence between painter and muse, leading to both of their deaths. In another, a young man upon reading the script decides he's the last in a long line of ill-fated American kings leading to the attempted regicide of his unknowing brother. Within its second story, The Mask, a triangle of forbidden lovers, wrought muses, and decadent artists, serves as the background to a tale of a strange formula that turns the living into unblemished marble. First with a perfect Easter lily, before unintentionally turning our narrator's muse into a lifeless statue. Seemingly perfect in every way, perfect, but dead. This drives the narrator to find solace within the pages of The King in Yellow, comparing his plight to that of the doomed kingdom on the shore of Carcosa. In time, that same preserved lily returns to life, foretelling the muse's resurrection, when it's revealed that the petrification was long-lasting, but ultimately temporary. Though The King in Yellow is best known for its concepts of corruptive thoughts lying within the written word, and symbols that drag one down to madness, something that is often overlooked is the deep throughline of yearning and broken romances throughout its tales. For the play, The King in Yellow, incites dire obsession in its reader. And what greater obsession is there than love? Art is subjective. Wouldn't you agree? At first glance, it seems like an obvious statement. The things you like in media are probably very different from the things I like. Even if we watch the exact same show, listen to the exact same album, or played the exact same game, we most likely enjoy different things about it. Yet, infamously, a lot of people don't see it that way. It's a common thing to toss around phrases like objectively good or objectively bad in regards to storytelling, as if these subjective feelings about media can be measured with numbers and calculations. Or hell, it's common to even come up with objective interpretations of an artist's work. Objective, final answers of what they meant, of what the real allegory was the entire time. 
Especially now, with the internet, when we can just go on Twitter and flat out ask them what their intended meaning was behind their symbolism. Or go on TV tropes, if you hate yourself. When every game has to have a theory behind it, when every ambiguity is a mystery box that must be solved, or when every symbol has to have rigid definitions, we start to treat stories as if they're puzzles, and not art pieces. We lose the beauty that comes in our own interpretation. So, what then do we make of a game that rejects the concept of objectivity itself? A work of art where even the most basic and fundamental facts are clearly overflowing with meaning, yet are still destined to be interpreted differently by all those who engage with it. Well, let's talk about that. My name is Ruby Seals, and we need to talk about Signalis. Signalis is a survival horror game released in 2022 by the two-person indie studio Rose Engine. Development began back in 2014, though the team didn't work on it full-time until the events of 2020. Their initial vision of the game was of a 2D side-scroller with horror elements. However, over time it morphed into an isometric 3D survival game, with occasional shifts to first-person. Since its release, it has reached widespread critical acclaim, even earning the praise of Guillermo del Toro, who presented it at the Tribeca Games Digital Showcase. In the survival horror game Signal is, uh, the true horror lies not in the shambling monsters uh, you'll find lurking in a subterranean bunker or an alien planet, but in what lies beyond the limits of human comprehension. The game's mechanics, aesthetics, and storyline overwhelmingly take small bits and pieces from other artworks, but brings them together in a way that contributes to a cohesive experience which is far, far greater than the sum of its parts. A very impressive gestalt, one might say. <laughs> uh, don't worry, that joke will be funny to you in like an hour. Signalis is a game that wears its inspirations on its sleeve. Elster, the character we play as, is controlled from a third-person, bird's-eye perspective, with semi-fixed camera angles, and an option for tank controls, as she shoots zombie-like enemies, struggles to find enough scarce bullets to do it, can only carry six items at a time, and solves puzzles to progress the story. Homages to Resident Evil and Silent Hill, particularly RE1R and SH2, are readily apparent. But to distill it down to just these two gameplay resemblances is to undersell it. There's no shortage of parts that feel like they're referencing more obscure horror. The space station retro future has elements from Alien Isolation, Dead Space, and System Shock. The sudden jumps to PS1-esque first-person perspectives almost feels like the space between. The philosophical terror of identity death feels a lot like Soma. The quiet sadness and transhumanism of replicants and gestalts from Nier, as well as its perspective hopping, the list of comparisons goes on. Anime stylings are also found throughout the game, with several dramatic shots and cutscenes that line up directly with those of Ghost in the Shell and Neon Genesis Evangelion. The liminal brutalism and decayed androids of Blame also seems to be a pretty obvious influence. As for film, Blade Runner's a very on-the-nose influence, as well as the 2001 cult classic Pulse. 
both in ways that are inherently spoilers to discuss. Oh, and this carpet's from The Shining. Sure, that has some symbolic meaning behind it that we'll discover later. No, this is not a joke. Remember this carpet. It will live rent-free in your head if you let it. The most overt references that the game gives us, though, are the works of literature and art which are directly betrayed in the game's universe. That of H.P. Lovecraft's The Festival, An Inhabitant of Carcosa by Ambrose Gwinnett Bierce, and then, of course, there's The King in Yellow, a reference that runs so deep we're going to have to hold off until we're finished with the story to begin unpacking it, but suffice to say, there is a good reason this video opened by talking about it. The paintings Isle of the Dead by Swiss artist Arnold Bockland and The Shore of Oblivion by German painter Eugene Brocht are also featured prominently. Fun bit of trivia, both these paintings are notable for having been later remade by their creators. Four times in Bockland's case. Wonder if that will be notable during the analysis, she said, knowing full well what kind of hell lay in wait. If it seems like I'm spending a hefty amount of time fixating on the various references and influences that Signalis nests within itself, you are correct. Because I am. There is so much to pull apart here and analyze. The game is practically begging to be looked at through a critical lens. The way in which it melds all of these things together into a story that isn't just a series of beautiful homages, but a beautiful work of art in its own right, is astounding. And if all that wasn't enough to convince you to join me on this ride, it's gay. It's super, extremely, fucking gay. Is this the gayest game released in 2022? Eh, strong contender if nothing else. Strap into your cosmonaut suits and ensure that your personas are fully stabilized, because we're about to delve the depths of Signalis. Starting with what it's like to actually live in this world. As Signalis wears its literary and cinematic influences on its sleeve, so too does it wear its gameplay inspirations. So much so that, for the more cynical, it might be easy to write it off as simply being a rip-off of the original Resident Evil and Silent Hill. However, also like its other influences, it blends them with a style and tone that makes it absolutely unique in its genre. On paper, the core gameplay loop of Signalis is the same as Resident Evil, RE2 and 3 in particular. Enter area, map it out via exploration as you collect key items alongside world-building lore documents which explain what the hell happened here, take the key items to their proper homes to be rewarded with more story-progressing key items, all while managing your very finite inventory with essentials like weapons, ammo, and healing as you store the things you pray you won't need in the Universal Hammer Space box. Rinse and repeat until you've collected all the important key items, whereupon the game will grant you access to the next big area while permanently locking the door behind you. Often while flinging a boss fight at ya. Combat itself handles like a less rigid Resident Evil, with the actual gunplay being one of the few areas where Signalis feels more in line with the remakes over the PlayStation classics. The player is free to move while aiming, though they will be slow to a crawl, as they line up their shots. This is especially vital as how much damage each shot does is generally dependent on how long you aim it, represented by an ever-shrinking targeting box. From there, it's up to you to make sure each bullet is used to its utmost potential, all while you have enemies breathing down your neck as they inch closer with each moment that you keep them in your crosshairs. In practice, this means that the ability to backpedal away from enemies to ensure safety and maximize targeting time is often vital for survival. As previously mentioned though, there is a custom setting for old-school-esque tank controls for purists who just have to have that traditional experience. If you are one of them, please know I respect you almost as much as I fear you. The most blatant thing Signalis snags from Resident Evil, though, is the legendary Crimson Head mechanic of the remake. Once you gun down an enemy, it still has a chance to get back up at any time to make your life miserable once again, unless you use a precious and scarce resource to burn the body to dispose of it for good. It does differ in that, unlike the Crimson Heads, the enemies aren't any stronger once they get back up than they were to begin with. 
Also unlike the Crimson Heads though, it is actually very common for enemies to get back up, to the point where it's not a matter of if an enemy will get back up, but when. Which you prefer is down to personal taste. However, I think it's worth noting that, given Signalis' lack of a traditional ammo-less melee option, any kills you get will come with a resource cost. As a result, watching a room full of enemies you just gunned down spring back to life while knowing that you do not have the bullets to consistently keep them down does a great deal to making the player feel eternally outnumbered. Because you are. And there's nothing you can truly do about it. This brings us to Signalis' second gaming inspiration, Silent Hill, SH2 in particular. From dealing finishing blows by stomping on enemies, to checking locked door after locked door, to pathways that lead you places they rationally shouldn't, to ominous save rooms that fill your screen with blood red whenever you use them, to whatever the hell this thing is, the DNA of Silent Hill runs deep. While there's no shortage of Silent Hill to be found in the game's mechanics, it's primarily felt in its enemy and level design, especially the level design. We will come back to that later. Suffice to say, though, that while the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is very Resident Evil, the vibes are Silent Hill all the way. Which influence is more pervasive between RE and SH, you ask? Doesn't matter. That's like asking if the cheese or the chips are more important when making nachos. The balance between the ingredients is arguably more important than the ingredients themselves. In the same vein, Signala strikes the balance between its two major inspirations effortlessly and creates something wholly original in the process. What I will say, though, is that while Signalis is not the best Resident Evil game, it is, without question, the best Silent Hill game we've gotten in at least a decade. P.T. does not count. Can you really say we got P.T.? Did we really get P.T.? Do you have P.T. right now? Is it in the room with you at this moment? If it is, that PS4 can buy you a new house. Signalis goes through a lot of effort to mirror Silent Hill's approach to storytelling and match its disorienting, surreal, otherworldly tone in a way that inevitably begs the question of what is and isn't real. There's much more that could be said about this, but it may be worthwhile to let the game speak for itself. So now, with all that established, let's run through the story for the uninitiated, and make sure we're all on the same page. The story of Signalis is told in a non-linear fashion, and at times is intentionally confusing. The flashes and images we see are that of a completely unreliable narrator, and the boundaries between one character and another, between fact and metaphor, between dreams and reality itself, are extremely blurry. As such, while I will try my best to be as neutral as possible in my summary, the nature of the story inherently means there will be points where I won't really be able to avoid having my own perspective color and frame certain events. When dealing with a work of art that conveys its story through abstraction and impression, there is only so much you can do before your personal reading begins to shine through. Thus is the struggle of the emotionally honest critic. I'm such a fucking loser, dude. <laughs> Be sure to like, subscribe, and kidnap me and drop me on the Fortnite island. Fuck. <laughs> it is worth noting, though, that no, this description is not going to serve as a replacement to the story. It can't. There are too many subtle motifs and repeating moments to collect them all at once, and too many interpretations of what they mean. And for this video not to be eight hours long, I'm looking at you, Salmatol, we're only going to cover the most important events of the game, in brief, to the best of our ability, while keeping tangents and asides to an absolute minimum. But there's so much to write about! To an absolute minimum. Minimum, starting now. I'm sure we'll be able to pull this off just fine without going into obsessive, hyper-specific detail. Do not look at the time code. Our great nation will know if you look at the time code. Oh, also, content warning for a lot of really intense things. Lots of blood and gore, vivid depictions of terminal illness, body horror, authoritarian cruelty, and claustrophobia just to name a few. 
full list on screen right now. This is never edgy for edgy's sake, but is a story which is undeniably a lot. So if you're not feeling up to that right now, then I completely understand. No hard feelings, and please, know that we'll be waiting right here if you ever change your mind. Also, also, spoilers for literally everything. Figure that merits stating in no uncertain terms. If you've thoroughly played this game already and just want the analysis, feel free to skip ahead to this timestamp. But I like to include everyone in the conversation when possible. Plus, as we'll see, there's a lot of subtle nuance and clues that are easy for even the most keen-eyed fans to miss. Now, let's establish the baseline and work from there, shall we? An LSTR unit, affectionately named Elster, awakens in the Penrose. A starship, though a junk tech one, more resembling something oppressive from Alien than the sleek future of Star Trek. We find an operation manual detailing that this ship has two crew members, a replica android and a gestalt human. Elster is the replica, but despite exploring the cockpit, the cryostasis pod, and all the cargo holds, her human companion is absent. The particularly observant may notice, though, that one of the two spacesuits is missing. We pick up a photo of our companion, a white-haired woman named Ariana Young, and exit the ship in search of her. We have crash-landed on an icy planet, and it seems that the only shelter to be found is clambering up a hill to a gate-like series of standing stones. We ascend and pass the threshold. On the other side is a dark red pit, leading down and down. At the bottom of the stairs, a narrow hole. We crawl through. The red walls of the passageway have a palpably biological feel to them. On the other side, we find a room. An impossible room that shouldn't be here, far away on some distant planet, yet filled with the retro-futuristic Cold War tech of the setting. The room itself seems cozy and strangely familiar to our protagonist. Filled with dusty old radio receivers, a series of tomes, an old bedroll made of leather with a chain safe atop it, an old CRT computer monitor with corresponding keyboard, and the flag of the revolutionary nation, the totalitarian, communist-coded regime our characters live under. When we turn around, the hole that we just crawled through is closed up behind us. As if a dream, or a nightmare, there seems to only be one way forward. Ahead of us is a book. The King in Yellow. And, as we pick it up,
blue screen of death. The screen most computers show when they hit a terminal processing error, for those of you not in the know. And identical to the screen we see when killed in the game itself. Also, those opening lines were from Lovecraft's Festival. Just tuck that away in your mind palace for later. We'll come back to it. For now, cue title drop. The game now reopens with its first major playable chapter, entitled Synchronicite, or Synchronicity. In Jungian psychology, the concept refers to the development of coincidences that appear meaningfully related, even when no causal connection is found, up to and including one's personal subjective experience of events in their mind versus the reality of the outside world. Elster stares into a bathroom mirror in a shot evocative of James Sunderland in Silent Hill 2. The only item we have on us is a photo that looks almost identical to the one we found in the ship, but with one distinctive difference. The person in this photo is a brown-haired girl named Alina So. As we explore our surroundings, we realize we've ended up somewhere completely new. The Serpensky School and Mining Facility on a distant planet called Lang. The facility appears to be on tight lockdown, and wherever we look we find the ever-present scrutiny of security cameras following us and East German-style propaganda posters. But there are no people, only curled-up corpses. The facility seems to be in the middle of a disaster. We stumble across another android, a star, or starling unit, used as local security. She tells us that this facility is lost, but Elster disregards her. We show the star the photo, and she tells us that if Alina's still alive, she's in the mines beneath the facility with the surviving gestalts, but also that they are all almost certainly dead by now. All of this begs the question, who is Alina, and how do we find her? Skirting through a library, several corridors, and a classroom, we eventually find our first weapon, a pistol. Especially useful as, shortly after we find it, the android corpses that litter the hallways begin to spring back to life as they attempt to stab us to death. Their faces shrouded with gauze after their organic components have slothed off. Each of the foes we'll find are named after birds, and each screams with a hawk-like cry when they notice our presence and swoop down to kill us. In the library nearby, we encounter another character. This one, a gestalt, a regular human. Her name is Isola Itoi, Isa for short. Oh, hello. You don't belong here either, do you? I'm Isa, Isa Itoi. You should be careful. There's something wrong with this place. I don't know what's happened, but it's probably dangerous to go any further. That's okay. I understand. I have something I need to do, too. Take care. I hope you find who you're looking for. On a table nearby, we find a note with her motive for being here. Much like us, she too is here in search of a loved one, and to rescue her if she can. Erica, if you find this note, despite everything that's happened, I've come to look for you, Isa. We see ourself echoed in her. After solving a couple puzzles, we find the key card to the final classroom, where we find a giant hole waiting for us. We jump down. We drop down to the next levels of the Serpinski facility, these ones far more resembling a mining plant than a classroom. We see evidence of a totalitarian state. Gestalt workers kept in inhumane, caged bunks in cramped dorms, while treated to appalling working conditions. 
hauled up to heavy-handed police and violently interrogated for even minor infractions. We even find fragments of Alina's diaries, though they tell us very little about where she is now. Only that she too seems to be exploited as a worker, made to work double or triple shifts for the crime of passing out due to either illness or exhaustion. Inside a lockbox of Alina's, we find a strange hexagonal stone plate with meat inside it. As soon as we touch it, we are carried away into another world. Abruptly transitioning from the top-down 2D perspective into a 3D environment is disorienting, though it seems that this vision can't be one of Elster's own memories. We make our way across a small bridge into a nearby shack as a blizzard rages. Inside, we find a few things of note. Letters on the table, addressed to Iris and Ariana Young. Books, radio receivers, and a computer which all look identical to the ones we found in the mysterious room at the start of all of this. A carpet pattern that I'm sure we'll never see again. And, next to an unbloomed flower, a radio frequency receiver. And, curiously, we can suddenly use it as part of our replica modules. We abruptly return to the present, but with the radio somehow still on our person. With it, we can acquire a keycard which grants us access to the elevator that will carry us down to the mines. However, no matter what floor we select, the elevator stops on floor 3. Our card is impounded as the display tells us to contact the administrator. The door opens, leading us into the hospital wing. There's still no one alive though only corpses and zombie-like replicas. As we begin to explore, we find another of Alina's diaries. Something is wrong. Nobody will tell me what's happening, but ever since I woke up, everyone has been behaving strangely. The protectors won't let me leave my room and return to work, even though the wound from my fall is already healed. I think there must have been an accident in the mine. I overheard two Yules whispering in front of my room that they're running out of staff. I'm worried that something has happened to Elster. I haven't heard from her in a while. I can't just sit around here any longer. The records in the hospital illuminate very little, only that a sudden sickness befell the whole staff of the Sierpinski facility, beginning with vomiting and quickly progressing to a hemorrhagic fever, visual loss, inability to communicate or think anymore, and ending with the skin and hair slothing away. In Gestalt's, this leads to death. In replicas, this leads to the zombie-like appearance and rabid defense responses that we've seen so frequently. To get out of the hospital, we must collect multiple keycards to pass through a door. Another gameplay motif that will reoccur several times throughout this game. Most of the keys are fairly obvious, found in locations that correspond with their names. Perhaps the most notable key, though, requires us to locate a video cassette. After finding it, we carry it back to a player. We put it inside, and... We again suddenly shift to first person, another memory of a time long past. This time, with a white-haired girl on a train. She vanishes, and in her place, we find a gold keycard. After returning to reality, though, we find the gold keycard in our inventory. Whether we just ended up in the past, or how that allows us to progress in the present, are left intentionally unclear. Once all the keycards are collected and the door opened, we are presented with our first boss fight of the game, a huge, hulking replica called Mina.
The very next moment, we are standing in front of a new face. A replica man called Adler. A visitor. Welcome to our facility. You've caught us at an unfortunate time. How can I help you? I'm looking for a gestalt. A worker at our facility? Let me see that picture. Alina Seo. I believe she is one of our factory workers. However... You shouldn't have returned. We awaken, but this time, somewhere else far different, as someone far different. On a different world, snow outside the windows, Isa wakes up in a classroom. She walks through the concrete hallway of her school, looking for her sister Erica. Instead, she finds a white-haired girl being attacked by faceless boys. You know, no matter who we play as, we always seem to be looking for someone, but never quite finding the right person. Wonder if that means anything. Eh, probably nothing. Carrying on. Elster picks herself up off the floor of the elevator shaft and- Oh, god damn! Adler's sure been busy killing off a whole lot of... Me's. Yeah, that's, uh... At least a couple dozen dead Elster units. Huh. Why do I feel like the story is about to get way more complicated? The deeper levels of the facility seem no less trash than the upper floors. Though this area has a new enemy type. The colibris, or hummingbirds, are a type of replica that have been engineered to have an ability called bioresonance. The ability to sense and amplify the feelings, emotions, and mental projections of others. As they have become infected and turned into the broken creatures we see in-game, they transmit their song of death and decay via our radio directly into our heads. I'm sure this plot point will never come up again. You see, by saying that, I'm flagging that actually the opposite's going to happen and that this will be really important later. My brain is huge. Speaking of, why does this painting seem familiar? Shortly after we jump down another hole, we see Issa making her way through another part of the facility, before being greeted by Adler, again recycling the same calm mannerisms with her as with us. It's implied it doesn't go well. In this area, we also find a model of the solar system. This is essential for a later puzzle, but also serves as one of our few glimpses into the broader world of Signalis. On it, we see eight celestial bodies, six of them named. We've seen many of these names before, as propaganda posters littered around the station. But now we have a proper frame of reference. Closest to the sun is Buyon home to the Imperial Palace, floating above the poisonous clouds. Next is Veneta, an ocean world ravaged by war. Elster notes that, When I close my eyes, I can hear the sound of the sea. After is Katej, the imperially occupied Red Desert. Then, orbiting around a much larger mass, is Rotfront, an ice moon still in the process of climaforming. As we approach the edge, we find another orbiting body, Hymath, the seat of the nation's government. And lastly, most distant from its home star, is Lang, the small planet we're on right now. You don't gotta memorize these, but trust me when I say that having this as a frame of reference will be very, very useful later. As we continue to explore the facility, we find more documentation about the replicas. 
their personas appear to have been copied, via bioresonance, from Gestalt templates, and pasted onto their mechanical bodies and mass, making them effectively mass-produced robotic clones. Yet it is noted that they are still all individuals in their own unique ways. No two are truly identical. Perhaps most importantly though, when treated in specific ways that correspond to their original personalities, their old Gestalt memories resurface, and they don't function as intended. When put under extreme enough duress, their personas may degrade. We find the door that Issa was trying to enter earlier. Inside is the unconscious leader of the facility, a tall and beautiful female replica named Falk. Nearby documents show that her form was modeled on the great revolutionary leader of this state. She has been built with vast bioresonant capabilities as well, letting her force her will on others and shape reality itself via semi-psychic means. She's also two and a half meters tall, so like, do with that knowledge what you will. But she cannot wake up. She lies, sleeping and sick, from whatever illness has brought this facility to its knees. Is this who Adler was protecting? Her diary lies beside her bed. I don't know how much longer I can go on. I do not want to live anymore as what I've become. The red eye beyond the gates showed me, no, touched me, poisoned me. It feels like my mind is being contaminated, defiled by another person's memories. I'm no longer fully myself anymore, but I've not fully become someone else either. I'm stuck here, between her and me, with half-formed dreams and recollections penetrating my brain, tainting my every action. Who is she? Who is that white-haired girl? Why do I long to see her again? Why would she curse me like this? Of note, another diary entry shows that Adler too has had his memories altered. He recalls us in Elster, coming to the facility multiple times over. Yet there is no record of an Elster ever having visited this place. As we fight our way through the halls, we search for the key card to the administrator's elevator, which can carry us to the mines below. In time, we find that that key card is hidden inside of a safe, and the key to that safe is hidden inside another copy of The King in Yellow. Alongside the final keycard, though, we also find Adler's full diary. Adler's diary, 8421D. Something is wrong. I can feel it. Is this really madness? When I read the pages of my diary, I recall events that never happened. A yesterday that never was, yet feels as real as the one I actually experienced. This cannot merely be a defect of my mind. It feels as though in this room I peer into another version of reality. How? I do not know. Perhaps I too have become sick like the others without realizing. But I will not succumb. A slow accumulation of reproduction errors, a gradual corruption of information, a story misremembered, slowly morphing with each retelling, like genetic material mutating and evolving, like the replica mind copied over and over from an aging template? I do not know. But I will find out. The answers lie below. I can feel it. Someone or something calls me from there. In the mine. We descend into the next chapter, Liminolitet. The quality of ambiguity and disorientation when one is at the middle stage of a rite of passage. When you've left one old life behind, but have yet to truly take your new form. Was this game written by trans people? Oh yeah, I guess it was. Of course it was. Of course it was. Of course it was. I see y'all. Same hat. We see Adler hunting down Issa, trying to stop her. But stop her from doing what? I know you're here. I've done this countless times before. You don't 
belong here. We follow them, now without the help of a map. As we make our way down, we find three survivors. All are important. The first is a MENA unit, just like the one we battled as a boss, laying slumped in a remote hallway. <sighs> Hello. You're not a protector, are you? What brings you here? I am Bio. If you're down here, you're probably looking for something. I'd help you, but... One of my hydraulics failed and I can't move. I'm pretty much done for, so you can just leave me here. There's no point repairing an old unit like me, so don't worry about it, okay? Be a waste of resources. Don't worry about me. There are many replacements. We're just replicas after all, right? In the end, what's one drop to an ocean? When I die, I'll just make another. Thank you for talking to me. Hope you find what you're looking for. The second is a couple. A star unit that lays dying as she attempts to console a Yule unit nearby. The star reminisces on good times past. Then, she makes one last confession. Hey, listen. I'll let you in on a secret. I can remember my name. From my old life. Isn't that funny? We finally arrive where we last saw Issa, and where Adler fell. There is no choice but to follow. As we jump in, for a flash, we see the depressed face of Alina So, watching on. We find ourselves in first person, again, disoriented, on a distant shore. In the distance we see an island, a coastline reflected in our old dreams, and seen in the paintings hung on the facility's walls. There are fragments of writing across the beach. Along the shore, the cloud waves break, the twin suns sink, yellow near the shadows lengthen. Each are lines from the king in yellow. As it nears the night, where black stars rise, and strange moons circle through the skies, but stranger still. Each discuss the distant land of Carcosa. Song of unsung, as tears unshed shall dry and die. It calls me in a sea of flesh. We will become one, but I can never go back to being me. In the real world novel, The King in Yellow, these fragments of Carcosa are what the book's characters read prior to their fall from sanity and descent into broken madness. The true horror of The King in Yellow is not just the idea of losing your grip on reality after reading madness-inducing text. It's that such knowledge is dangerous. It's that it spreads. This summary shall resume shortly. But first, has this ever happened to you? Oh fuck, I need to move right now! Me, this is me. I'm talking about me. Hi, this is an ad for my Patreon. So, I'm being forced to move very suddenly and very far and very unfairly in a way that's very expensive. In all the years I've had this channel, I've tried really hard to avoid leaning on any kind of sob story when it comes to things like this. And even right now, in my heart of hearts, I absolutely hate having to bring it up 
at all. However, circumstances being what they are, I'm going to be really honest and say that if you're able to, we could really use the support now more than ever over on Patreon. Just a couple dollars a month sincerely makes all the difference. And in exchange, you'll get updates on plans for the channel, previews of big projects like this one, your name in the credits, and even little doodles by our resident artist, Clark. And if one-time donations are more your thing, we also have a Ko-fi and PayPal as well. Any and all support would be more appreciated than words could possibly describe. And since I'm going to have to start packing the moment the curtain drops on this, I think we'll leave it at that. Thank you for your consideration. Liking, subscribing, and commenting also help a great deal as well. Fuck landlords! Back to the summary. The vision ends. We reawaken somewhere completely, unrecognizably different. It looks like the hospital's morgue, but somehow... wrong. The metal is rusted and decayed. The walls eventually give way to so much rotting, pulsating meat, and- Oh god damn it, we're literally just stealing from Silent Hill now, aren't we? Look, I have to draw a line somewhere, and that line is at this place looking and feeling like the place that it straight up stole its name from. And... <sighs> I've been very forgiving about this game's homages, for reasons we will, again, get into later. But this one in particular gets under my skin, and not in the sexy way. Sorry, getting distracted. Back to the summary. Ahem. Much like Silent Hill, something is going extremely wrong here. Is Elster the only one who sees the world like this? meat monstrosities and all. Our foes look different, even more deformed, even more monstrous, and they writhe on the floor in pain in ways that feel even less human. We see a nuclear waste warning before finding a hole made of meat. No prizes for guessing what we do next. At the bottom we find Issa again, and she isn't alone. After fending it off long enough to give her a chance to reload, Issa fires an anti-tank rifle to kill it, knocking herself unconscious in the process. Once it's dead, the wall that was marked with a radiation warning becomes a doorway. Inside we find what looks like a morgue. In the center, what appears to be a coffin, or a hospital bed or a cryopod, with only the shadow of a body left behind on it. Here we find a bottle of smelling salts that we can carry back to Issa to wake her up. She thanks us by giving us the rifle, and then proceeds to vanish once we leave. Shortly after, we discover a door with slots matching plates similar to the one we found alongside the radio module back on the upper levels of the Stropinski facility. That plate is used here. Five more similar plates with unique carvings are found all throughout the flesh-filled area, all hidden behind a series of intricate trials and puzzles. It can be easy to miss on first playthrough, but this is not the first time we see these plates. All six of them first appear in that mysterious room we entered at the beginning of the game, sealing the king in yellow shut. How they arrived here, or what caused them to detach from the tome, is anyone's guess. As we search for them, though, we find what ultimately turns out to be Alina So's final diary entry. How long has it been that I'm down here? How did I get here? Where is this place? And why am I here? My memory feels so blurry, 
as if I had always been here. Forever. Even my hair is slowly turning white. I remember my name. And I remember my life. But I also remember a different name. And a different life. And it feels like the line between her and me... is blurring the longer I stay here. The line between the self and the other blurs, as the ways in which we identify ourselves fall apart. Who are we if we aren't the person our memories tell us we are? We bring the plates back to the door and open the path. Upon stepping outside, though, the place we find is immediately familiar. Opening the door doesn't lead to Alina, or Ariana, or escape. It instead just leads back to the deep hole in the ground, right where we started from. At the top of the hole is the same dark stone gate, shrouded black against a bright red sky. It is impossible to move on. I've been here so many times. But I have never returned. The commander never spoke about what she saw out there. I'm sure whatever it was, it was what made her fall sick. Something about her changed when she returned. She was no longer our beloved leader, Falk. What waits beyond the threshold? It doesn't matter.
Anyways, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Sure you can see why I love this game so much, and of course that's not the end of the game. Don't be fooled by the fake out. We've still got one last major leg of our journey to work through here. Also, apologies for letting the whole scene play out in full, but as we'll see, this might be the single most important moment for truly unearthing what's actually happening in this story. Before we begin that though, I want to take a quick moment and just point out a couple of the most important images that flash by, which can be easy to miss on a casual playthrough when you're not combing through everything frame by frame in Premiere Pro. You know, things like this. And this. Also this. Definitely this. Especially this. And this. Perhaps most subtly, this. And, most of all, this. We will be unpacking all of these in a bit once we have a bit more context to be able to appreciate what we're actually looking at here. But suffice to say that I think these images are absolutely essential to understanding what is actually going on in this game. And what it means. So yeah, just go ahead and tuck that away in your mind palace for later as well. Right next to the game over screen at the start of the game. For now though, we will begin our journey anew where we can finally get some clear answers. As the game reopens, we see Elster once more awaken in the Penrose. But this time, it seems brighter, more functional. And it isn't long before we realize the ship is in flight. We are living through the past. We move through the cabins, repairing small systems, and doing everything the Elster unit replica was originally intended for. As we go about our errands, we find the notes of Scout Officer Ariane Young. Technical Service Records, Scout Officer Young Ariane. Officer's Note. I've adjusted the ship's internal clock to run slightly slower. By my calculations, each cycle should be exactly 6.13% longer. Simulating what I believe is the length of a day on Veneta. I wonder if Elster will notice the difference. Judging from her accent, I'm sure that she's Venetan. She pronounces ship just like Issa and Eri used to. It's very cute. Hearing her speak makes me dream of the ocean. I wonder if I'll ever get to visit something like it. Maybe on a distant world? Other documents show that this vessel was designed to search beyond the solar system for distant, resource-rich planets. The implication is that we've been in space for the better part of eight years. We see Ariane's paintings scattered around. She seems like someone who cares immensely about art and self-expression. We also find another document. This one meant for the eyes of Gestalt officers only, but still sealed. We look at it anyways. Previous experience with this replica model has given us insight into irregularities in their behavior that stem from the original neural pattern used for this unit. Due to the sensitive nature of this information, this document should be destroyed after reading. Elster units were chosen for the Penrose program for their adaptability and reliability under long-term isolation conditions. Stoic and reserved, Elster units have a relatively stable neural pattern. It is best for you to leave it alone and interact with the Elster unit as little as possible. Elsa's neural pattern was a soldier of Vinatan origin, so their needs are basic. Avoid talking to the Elsa unit about the war. Penrose vessels are fitted with a specialized calibration pod which may help with persona stabilization. To avoid resurfacing of Gestalt memories, do not show or give the Elsa unit photographs, especially of soldiers during the war. Do not show the Elsa unit movies or let it listen to music. Do not try to befriend the Elsa unit. The warnings from her totalitarian state fell on deaf ears. Ariane has already befriended Elster, though that is underselling it.
Elster, you're up. <laughs> I missed you. I missed you too. Oh, it's our 3000 cycle anniversary. We'll be getting updated mission parameters later, so I thought it'd be nice to celebrate. Wait, let me put on some music. If the Space Soviets told me not to fall in love with my gay crewmate, I'd ignore him too. Just as we begin to get used to the safety and comfort of Ariane, though, we return to the present. We see Ariane, her once short white hair now flowing over her shoulders. The same pose as Issa, the same pose as Alina. Then. is broken. The life support systems are non-operational. Blood-stained diary entries lie scattered on the floor. Lost another tooth. There was so much blood. My hands were shaking. Why is my hair falling out? I can't sleep. I just want to sleep. Please, just let me sleep. In the cryobay is a mass of roiling flesh, sinking madness in its center. Beside it lies a dead Elster unit, specifically a combat model with chestplate armor. And we, of course, take what we need. I made a promise. I'll do anything. I can't stop now. We drop down another impossible hole, and resurface on that distant shore of oblivion, which we now recognize is the island from Ariane's paintings. Once again, we find pages scattered along the coastline. Those who sing the same song have heard it in their dreams. A dark tone at the edge of hearing, a silent voice whispering to my heart, come join us. Together, we will be eternal. There is no escape. We will be one. But I fear that dark sea will swallow me. Something old, far older than humanity, sleeps deep below the ground. Those of us who can hear its call in the night, an invitation, an ocean of memories where I ends and we begin. Great holes secretly are digged where the Earth's pores ought to suffice, and things have learned to walk that ought to crawl. We should have never left the primordial soup. Only through death can I escape the call of the one who rules above all life. Kill me. Kill me. Kill me. 
We reawaken again. Chapter 3 Gestalterfall. The psychological term for staring too long at a complex thing until it breaks down into its constituent parts, meaningless as a whole. Elster stares at herself in the bathroom mirror, again mirroring James Sunderland. We have returned to Serpinski. The cycles continue. Again, we are still trapped. The facility is even more decayed than we left it, covered in flies and flesh. A chalkboard confirms what we already know. You've been here before. We perform the same actions. We open the same safe, using the same code. We fight through the same corridors. We jump down the same gaping maw of a hole. As we fall, we again see Adler and Falk. You've changed. He kneels to kiss her forehead as she lies unconscious. As he rises to stand, flesh grows over him. It's like everything was taken apart and put back together by someone who doesn't understand how it works. I, I have, have become, become whole again. I wear no mask. And, and I, I hate, hate everything. everything. Elster stands, awake and unafraid, in the colony of Rockfront, a distant moon of a different planet. Despite this being a completely different location and colony, echoes of what we found before remain. The southern subway looks like fragments of the flesh world. The alleyways feel almost familiar to the Serpensky halls. They are patrolled by the same foes and we jump down the same ominous holes. It all begs the question of if any of this is even real. If not, then who's creating this? Whose memories are we living in? Who lived in Rotfront? There are a lot of really important files here. Too many to possibly include in full. Reports of the nation struggling to get ration shipments to Veneta at the height of the war. An acknowledgement that the replicas are a byproduct of bio-residents that they have very little understanding of, and, in fact, are so far advanced beyond the computer technology they have that it will possibly take them centuries to be able to make a fully synthetic replica. A dream journal depicting a series of grisly ends that consume the dreamer. An email from Ariane's aunt discussing how her niece has the only key to their photo store. Rumors from multiple sources of an Imperial spy somewhere in this sector. A teacher's evaluation of Ariane, scornfully describing her as remarkably odd due to having been raised by her mother instead of a community overseen by a block warden because of her obsession with art and other such nonsense, as well as her friendship with the Atoys. The teacher closes out by remarking that they can only hope military service will beat those frivolous ideas out of her in a way that this school has failed to do so far. But even among all these files, there is one that stands out as exceptionally important. There exists a strange folklorish idea in many sectors of Rotfront related to pareidolia, the tendency to see meaningful images and random patterns like seeing a face in an ink blot, or letters in a smudge of dirt. It is well known that the so-called Red Eye is simply an anticyclonic storm produced by a high-pressure region in the atmosphere of Rotfront's planet. 
Yet for some of the early settlers of Rotfront, this natural phenomenon became symbolic of their struggle and way of life. That red spot in the sky became a perfect metaphor for the ever-present surveillance by the protectors and the tight grip of the central government on Heimat. Even today, the idea of an unblinking, watchful eye observing their every move still resonates strongly with the people here. As we explore, we collect tarot cards, though their purpose isn't immediately self-evident. After a card is collected, a mass of flesh erupts out of the space we found it in. In our search for them, though, we also find a database of old medical records, which just so happens to include Ariane, the Atoy twins, as well as some uncannily familiar faces. This also serves to confirm that both Issa and Ariane called Rotfront their homeworld. Though notably, Ariane was born on the planet of the Serpinski Station, Lang. As we hunt for the final keys to complete the last puzzle of Rotfront, we enter the Atoy's old bookstore, the place where the twins grew up. And inside, we find Issa. I couldn't find her. I've looked everywhere, but she's not here anymore. I can't go on. I'm sorry. Her flesh falls apart. She becomes nothing but a shadow on the floor. Behind her, we find the tarot card for the Death Arcana, lying in front of a shrine with portraits of Erica and Issa. In the back room, we discover a book that was banned by the nation. How come? Well... There exists a connection between all of us that few are fully aware of. A song that we all dance to, but few can hear. This deep vibration of the cosmos cannot just be heard and felt. We all resonate in harmony with it, shaping it, deforming it around us. Those select few who can consciously perceive it often fear it. Too oppressive is the sound of the stars, too invasive the noise of the unaware around them polluting the song with their fickle emotions. But every once in a while, some are born that can not only hear and play this music of the worlds, but who can conduct it. Gifted individuals capable of manipulating the essence of the world around them. Many believe that the Grand Empress is such a being. Her immense will bent humanity into the Empire of Yusan and lifted us to the stars. It was her power that imbued life into the first of the machine servants that now carry the weight of the Empire on their carbon steel backs. Shortly thereafter, we find a photo store. Young photos. There's not much inside, only some film development solution, and a single photo. A picture of two soldiers standing beside each other. The person on the right is familiar to us. Alina So, the woman we have spent so long looking for. Though she is missing one eye, the face of the person on the left also feels familiar. Because of a lot of things we'll get into later, which you may already be piecing together yourself, there's strong evidence suggesting that this is the human gestalt whose neural patterns were the template for Elster's persona. We never find out her name for certain, but of the names listed on the photograph, there's only one that distinctly stands out. Lilith. Itoi. And finally, as one vitally important cherry on top, we discover a message from the Imperial spy, discussing why they ran away. I've been found out. I'm sure the white-haired girl working at the photo store in Sector C is bioresonant. 
Be careful. We set the tarot cards down in accordance with an anonymous person's dreams, giving us the answer to the final puzzle of the game. Once it's solved, a familiar tunnel of flesh opens up. We crawl through until we are out the other side, into a small room with a radio in the corner, Elster now noting that it's Ariane's, and that it's still transmitting. Textbooks on radio operation, belonging to Ariane's mother, alongside Ariane's favorite imperial cereals. Ariane's old wardrobe, Ariane's old bedroll, black and white photos of Ariane's paintings, a CRT monitor on the table, a chained safe in the corner, the flag of the nation, this time described by Elster as meaningless, and lying upon the table, a copy of the King in Yellow, with no seals remaining to bind it. The last seal has been broken. It's time to go home. As we enter the final safe room, we find more documents scattered. Letters from Ariane's family, official documents suggesting that if Ariane didn't get into the Penrose space program, that she would have been assigned to the Sapensky mining facility. A letter from Ariane's mom, mentioning that she saw the photo from the store, and that she feels like Alina and Ariane look so alike, they could have been twins. Even if they don't have anyone named So in their family. But nothing that changes what happens next. It's time to leave forever. As we make our final approach, papers on the ground tell us everything we need to know about the replicas who were never on the Penrose. All efforts to contain this illness have been in vain. All the Gestalt workers have succumbed to it, leaving only dark shadows on the walls and floors where they died. And soon all of us replica will have lost our senses and turned into writhing masses of flesh. I now believe it was not an infectious disease, nor some form of poison or radiation. It was a slow corruption of reality itself, as I have relived the same cycle over and over. Each time details changed, things are twisted, added, removed. How long until it turns into nothing but noise? The crashed ship. A strange gate. A hole in the ground. An island beyond reach. Memories from other lives. Dreams of suffering and loneliness. A promise. A search for someone lost. I, I saw her in the red emptiness waiting for me. We had made a promise. As the memories of a stranger rushed into my mind, I felt the borders of myself blur. Now I can no longer tell where Falk ends and Elster begins. nothing for you here. You've tried so many times, and you've failed so many times. Don't you see that you're ruining everything? This is your final warning. We were dancing to that song they start the broadcast with. We fell asleep watching that movie. We'd seen before so many times. If only I could take us back to that time when we were happy. These memories are mine now. Why did he return? 
There's nothing for you here. She'll never dance with us again, no matter what we do. She doesn't even want us anymore. Both of us, we are incomplete. Let us become whole again. As the fight begins, Falk uses her bioresonant powers to telepathically summon assistance and manifest spears that she then hurls at us with telekinesis. Each of these attacks is accompanied by a flash on the screen, a glitch, with text alternating between begging for help and threatening us with death. We use Falk's own weapons against her, and with each spear we return to her, she lets out a bioresonant scream that completely changes the world around us, twisting and shifting it into shapes recognizable to both herself and Ariane. Six rounds of slaughter, six shields orbiting around her, six spears stabbed through Falk's face. With the last, she tells Elster, Now, we are one. Once again, you've returned. Are you really willing to go through with this once more? You've seen what happens. This world cannot take much more. This may be our last chance. Elster climbs to the precipice. Adler cannot stop her. If you go back, it'll all fall apart. I can't let that happen. He moves to stab her, but she shoots him in the stomach. The knife destroys her right eye. She continues past the gate. Adler lays dying on the floor. You'll destroy everything. Elster reaches the Penrose. The airlock seal has already been pulled open by the previous Elster. It's loose. She opens it. Inside, we find Ariane's final notes. Cycle 225. When I signed up for this mission, I just want to get away from everything. I was sick of Rotfront, of school, of the photo store, sick of the fake smiles and the whispering behind people's backs. When I saw the photo of that soldier, I wondered who she was. Was she happy? 
Was her family proud of her? Did her comrades love her? Since we looked alike, could I have been like her? But in the end, I just wanted to leave. Nothing I'd done or made ever meant anything to anyone, so why bother? Here, I'm finally free. I get to be by myself and do what I want. I'm finally happy. We also find Ariane's last orders. Phase three, transmission. Congratulations, comrade. You've survived 3,000 cycles, reaching the final phase of the Penrose program. With the end of the operational lifetime of your replica unit approaching, it is time to prepare for the final phase of your mission. With the end of the operational lifetime of your replica unit approaching, it is time to prepare for the final phase of your mission. If you have not found a suitable world for landing by this point, accept that you will not. Find solace in the thought that others might be successful where you failed. As you are probably aware, your ship's spare parts and rations will soon be depleted. Life support systems and reactor shielding will soon begin to fail, and radiation may begin to leak from the cooling system. We recommend that you don't attempt to prolong your suffering by reusing old filters or rationing supplies. Instead, make peace with your fate. We suggest that you ask your replica, while it is still functional, to spare you a slow and agonizing death, or that you take permanent rest in the cryogenic pod. Remember, you will die having served your nation by partaking in a glorious demonstration of our power. Another unfinished painting. There is never enough time. We reach the ship's reactor, leaking radioactive coolant, far beyond what any human could survive. Cycle 2503. I think I lost more hair. I'm sitting here, getting older, and every time I wake up, I feel older, weaker, and sicker. I get out of breath so easily lately, and my back hurts when I sit down. How much longer will this go on? It feels like I'm just slowly dying. Cycle 5,000 and something. I'm tired of it all. Every time I go to sleep, I wonder if I'll wake up again. I'm scared that it'll be the last time I said goodnight to her. Did I say it right? Will she be okay? What if one of us just won't wake up tomorrow? I don't want to die. I don't want to live anymore either. Everything is just so exhausting. I just want to lie down and disappear. I just want to sleep. Please just let me sleep. Please just make it stop. Please. And in a side room. The room where they danced all those years ago. We find the corpse of the original Elster. I couldn't keep my promise. Despite my best efforts, I eventually fell ill, too. It had to end this way. Ahead lies the cryopod. The moment Elster walks through the door, one of three endings plays out. We approach the cryopod, the hospital bed, the coffin, the image that we've seen echoed so many times, in so many places. 
Our actions also echo what we've seen before. Elster leans down to kiss Ariane in her sickbay, the same way Adler kissed Falk. I've come back for you. It's me, Elster. Elster. I'm sorry. I don't remember. That's okay. Elster, unable to fulfill her promise to Ariane, falls by her side. Please, just let me stay by your side a little longer. Ariane places her hand on Elster's head. Her body shuts down, dying in the exact same position as the Elster unit we stripped our chest piece from. But what if she did remember? A different Elster manages to complete the cycle, and make it to Ariane's cryopod once more. She kisses Ariane's forehead. This Ariane remembers. Elster. I can't do it. You have to do it. It's time for this to end. Please. I'm sorry. Thank you. Heartbroken, Elster steps away from the cryopod. Her mind at its end, she falls to the floor, in the same position as before. Life fades from her eyes. A different Elster, still, under a different sky, reaches another ending. Elster walks out into the desert, outside the Penrose. Her combat harness lies on the ground.
she curls up and finally dies. To her right, from the side of the Penrose, a gentle, glowing white light can be seen. And those are the three endings you can earn. Well, by default, anyways. Because I lied. There is actually one more. A final, secret ending, which allows the player to skip the last fight with Falk, can be found. If the player tunes their radio to the right frequency, in the right locations, which can be discovered by running specific radio transmissions through a spectrogram, they can collect a trio of deeply obscure keys. Once they're found, their descriptions become telling in their own right. Key of love. Cycle 888. I've tried to teach Alster how to dance. It's so cute how clumsy she can be when it comes to these things. Cycle 1024. Before I met Alster, I never believed that I would find someone I could fall in love with like that. Key of eternity. Are you still looking for answers where there are only questions? There's nothing but heartbreak at the end. The key of sacrifice. On the horizon, I saw a star fall into the sea, and the sound of thunder, like trumpets of angels, flew over the water. A mix of hail, fire, and blood hit my wet face, and a third of all creatures that lived in the sea died. If the player has collected all three of the keys by the end, they will be able to remove the chains from around the safe in the room where they find the king in yellow. This will allow Elster to input a 20-digit long password, which the game tells you directly during the main story, in order to unlock the safe itself. Inside is a potted white lily. After being prompted with the only blue highlight text in the game, Elster picks the lily up. And, well, I'll let it speak for itself. So, what the hell does any of this mean? Well, to understand that, first we're going I to got need this. to- I got this! Yeah. Um, <clears throat> hello. My name is Silmatil. You might know me from my own incredibly long pathologic videos, or that time I got entirely too emotional about the Jedi XL for eight solid hours, and I'm here to explain to you what the game actually means, because much as I respect and love her, I don't trust Ruby to do it correctly, which is why I'm now insisting on this mutual collaboration using this taser. So, without further ado, let's finally start analyzing this rich text in full, shall we? <sighs> I miss my wife, Tails. <laughs> I miss her a lot. I'll be back. <laughs> the story that we've seen is a very complex and nuanced tale. Like Alina, Ariane, Ruby, Codex said back at the start, we try to present it with neutrality, but our own biases and interpretation will bleed, shine through. 
my interpretation of the game and its events is purely my own and purely subjective. And, as I've learned, my take is somewhat controversial. I personally don't believe in any alien presence in the game, or that the madness that we see is influenced by the outer gods or anything like that. I put everything down to human nature, bio resonance, and inevitable tragedy. A quick primer. Bio resonance in the game is portrayed as an ability that certain people have, and this was carried over to certain replicants. A form of hyper empathy, it allows a person that experiences it to understand the thoughts and mind of another, even to the point of quite literal mind reading. The Calibri units with their strange radio signals act as bioresonant conduits, taking a person's feelings as if they were a radio signal and echoing and amplifying them. Bioresonance, or this ability to read and interpret someone's entire brain as if it were a radio wave, is a technology that allowed human minds to be copied and pasted onto android bodies. It's simple when you know how, just decode it like tuning a radio, and control C, control V what you find. The most powerful bioresonant replicant in the game is the Falk unit at the end. The one who could pick up on another's thoughts and memories so strongly that she became heavily affected by them until they became her. Inadvertently copying and pasting someone else's persona over herself. I don't think that the entire universe is literally falling apart by the actions of Alster and Ariane, I interpret it as much more personal and figurative, but your mileage may vary. I don't believe that there is a best ending either. I believe that all of the endings are vital to tell the story, but the internet begs me for pithy analyses and short, easily digestible sound bites, so with reluctance, here is my hot take. The relative bad to good scale of the endings is, memory is the quote unquote worst, Promise is next, and leave is the quote-unquote best ending. Let me explain my thoughts. All of the events that we witness in the game are just echoes of the trauma of Elster and Ariane. Another revolution of the cycle, turning indefinitely, quite literally taking us back to the beginning, over and over. The Elster unit that we play as is a copy of a copy of a copy, the decaying identity of Lilith Itu, her personality pasted repeatedly onto so many androids that who Lilith is or was no longer entirely matters. My assumptions are that Lilith was a soldier in the war and likely fell in love with her comrade Alina Seo. We never find out what happens to either of them. It's possible that both of them are long dead before the game begins. It's possible that Alina Seo really did go to Sierpinski after the war and that Lilith really did try to follow her, but we can never truly confirm it. Given how much of their story is just conjecture, assumption, and the reports of unreliable narrators, it's hard to tell. But I assume that Lilith fell in love and was extremely devoted. Perhaps she made a promise to find Alina and protect her, no matter what. Perhaps she spent her life loving her partner and being her metaphorical knight in shining armor. Lord knows I understand the drive to do that with my gay loves. And then their stories played out once again between Elster and Ariane. Elster, the copied personality and memories of a quiet, reserved, queer woman, is placed aboard a ship with Ariane, a joyful and expressive queer woman. One who even looks a lot like Alina used to. It was inevitable that Elster would once more fall in love, just as it was inevitable that the mission would be doomed to failure as their totalitarian states sent them to die. To the revolutionary government of Yusan, they were just expendable, cheap meat. And, as the game begins, we find a copy of Elster, or a copy of a copy, who has lost their loved one, and who feels she must search to find them against all odds. She doesn't know why she has to search, only that she must. It's not even conscious knowledge, it's instinct. It's echoes of someone else's memories, someone else's devotion, but without the substance of who they were devoted to or why. She has to act on that instinct, even though there's a part of her that knows that instinct will only ever lead to tragedy. Alster's memories are unreliable from the beginning. Confusing her former human life and her current one, she can no longer tell the difference between herself and Lilith. She can no longer tell the difference between Alina and Ariane. 
She only understands herself by what she feels she must do, be loving and devoted, and to trying to find her loved one no matter what. We see this doomed search reflected in Issa Itu, who, like Elster, is determined to find her lost loved one no matter what. But there is no way that this can possibly end in success. Her loved one, Erika Itu, is likely already dead. And, like Elster, that eternally devoted search will be what kills Issa in the end. Perhaps Issa is already dead and just a ghost. There's a memorial to her in Rotfront, after all. Perhaps she is a memory, playing out in Elster's perceptions of someone else whose care and courage will kill them. The pattern of Elster broadcast to another, the pattern of devotion and love in a doomed world and an inevitably painful end. We also see this reflected in the interactions between Adler and Falk, one sick and comatose, the other devoted and caring. Adler's kiss to Falk on her deathbed is almost exactly the same as Elster's kiss to Ariane. Adler's seemingly selfless devotion to Falk is reflected in Elster's devotion to her lover, even when she can't tell who her lover is anymore. As Adler begins to fall apart and into pieces, he seems to become more closely tied to Elster, as if, subconsciously, he is becoming her. Falk herself resembles Ariane in some interactions, Elster in others, and even Alina at times, and her diaries clearly state that the identity of Elster is bleeding into her. Falk is becoming someone else too, though I'd argue that Falk is the horrific amalgamation of both Elster and Ariane. She is the person that Elster must struggle hardest to kill, the way she struggles to kill Ariane. She is Elster in her cycles of guilt. Even the physical signs of Elster are slowly copied onto others. Elster is a copied remnant of Lilith, a woman who lost her right eye in the war. As Adler approaches his greater understanding of his world's slow death, he too loses his right eye. Issa, as well, has lost her right eye by the time we find her in Rotfront. And by the end of the game, in order to see past the precipice, our Elster too, loses her right eye. The symbology to me is important. This is akin to the sacrifice of Odin to understand and know what lies beyond the stone gate of death. But what are we to make of everyone slowly falling into these dynamics of Elsters and Ariannes, of the star-crossed lovers, one doomed to search and never find their love, the other doomed to sickness and death? Not only are these cycles repeating, but they are amplifying like a radio signal echoing over and over in an eternally growing feedback loop. This is the horror of the King in Yellow, not that there is some malevolent god with evil intent. It's just echoes, radio signals in the dark, crashing into each other and amplifying. The natural laws of a universe, as inevitable as mathematics, as insidious as radiation. Cancer has no will, no thought, no intentional malice, it's just nature. It's a shitty thing that happens. But that doesn't mean that the suffering it leaves in its wake is any less horrifying to those who experience it. There's nothing good left here, there is only pain. It's eternal recurrence, and it's exponential growth. The cycles have to end. Thus to me, Adler represents someone who wants desperately to preserve what little comfort remains in his world. He has killed many an Elster to do it, and he will do so again. If he must prolong the cycles a few revolutions more, just to preserve the decaying remains of a folk he loves, he'll do so. He is afraid of what lies beyond the threshold. Like Elster, he has made it to the precipice of the stone gate of death, but unlike her, he can't bring himself to move beyond it. The memory ending to me, in which Elster chooses not to kill Ariane, is ultimately a tragic one. Ariane doesn't even have her memories of Elster anymore to comfort her, she's just suffering for no reason. To allow Ariane to live on, as Elster tries to cling to what few positive memories remain, only prolongs an already painful process. To come to this ending is merely to be like Adler. It's to come to the precipice and choose not to do the right thing, because she's afraid, because she doesn't want to lose what little she has left, because she can't bear to do it. It's a selfish choice, to my mind, even as it is an understandable one, and it breaks my heart.
As Elster powers down, we see her corpse fall beside Ariane. She is now merely one more android in the cycle, her plate armoured to be scavenged for parts when the next Elster arrives to complete the deed and finally end this cycle for good. The promise ending is reflective of one in which Elster finally fulfills her promise. Ariane remembers her. It's so bitter, so sad, so painful to watch. But Elster does what Ariane asks her to do. We even see a little note on the screen saying thank you, indicating that this really is what Ariane wanted. It hurts. I cry watching it. Alistair should never have had to face something like that. It's not fair. But it's the right thing to do. And yet, even as she does so, she still falls beside Ariane, heartbroken and faltering. Her corpse, once more, becomes the same Alistair unit that we strip for parts in the third act. Even as she's done the right thing for Ariane, that doesn't free her of her anguish or pain or make everything better for her. In life, we rarely conclude our stories with one big dramatic act. We rarely get full closure just by finishing the story. We ruminate. We reflect. We consider if we did the right thing. We torture ourselves with guilt or frustration or anger. And while we do so, we cannot find peace. We may have finished the chapter, but we have not yet let go. And so the cycles must continue. To me, the leave ending is the only true way to finish the cycle. In the end, it was all too much for Elster to take. She couldn't stay by Ariane's corpse any longer. While some see this as Elster choosing the coward's option and that it is a mutually exclusive ending with the others, I see this ending only occurring after Elster has already completed her promise. Outside, dawn surfaces on the wreckage of the Penrose. A new dawn with golden light, not the darkness we've come from. Elster leaves the ship behind, walking out onto the beach. We see her discard her combat harness on the ground. She doesn't need it anymore. She doesn't have to repeat the same cycles and fight and die and kill anymore. She doesn't have to keep torturing herself. She collapses on the beachfront and dies, curled up in the fetal position, but with the sun on her face and wind in her hair. She gets that heaven off the ship that Ariane so wanted to experience, no longer burdened with her pain, no longer weighed down by her cycles of guilt. The final title card that we see in this conclusion simply says, End, at the bottom left. The last that we see of Alster is her body, as flecks of golden light wash across the planet's surface. It's still a deeply sad ending, but at least now they're both free. One from a life of ongoing torment, the other from her cycles of endless guilt. I think that these endings can only be understood alongside one another, and not entirely on their own. My interpretation is, after all, based on a gestalt, as it were. I have a lot more thoughts about the game that I'll probably distill into a full video of my own in the not too distant future, as there's, you know, so much to unpack. Yeah, I disagree with a lot of that reading, but it does make sense. Jesus, I stun prodded you. What, what the hell are you doing here? You forgot to step on me, so I revived less than a minute later. I've just been hanging out in the corner because I was curious about your take. Ah, uh, okay. Well, I'm glad that you like my reading either way, so, uh, uh, no hard feelings about the electrocution? Oh no, I'm absolutely livid. That hurt quite a bit. Plus, I still need to give the real analysis that I originally planned on before I was so rudely interrupted. Which means that I need to get you out of here. So... Ah, uh, uh, well, fair enough. Uh, well, look, <laughs> it's okay, babe. I I'm into electricity anyway, and... <laughs> and we're back. Fortunately, she did lay a lot of the groundwork I was already planning to establish, so honestly it all works out. However, there is one final reference to unpack, and one that I oddly haven't seen anyone else talk about. The name of the station itself, Serpinski. 
Let's talk about a Polish mathematician. I apologize in advance for the pronunciation that's about to be butchered. Wawczaw Sierpinski was a Polish mathematician born in Warsaw in 1883, during the Russian Empire's occupation of Poland. During this time, the Russians had set about forcing their language and culture upon the Poles. In a deliberate effort to keep illiteracy high and school enrollment low. An effort that worked. Sierpinski was unusual then, in how he was able to bypass the hurdles put in front of him and find his way to a thoroughly imperialized University of Warsaw at the age of 16 in 1899. By this time, the staff and all their lectures were completely Russian, making the Polish-born Sierpinski a decided outsider until being taken under a teacher's wing. Four years later, he won his first award for his contribution to number theory, but held off on publishing it until 1907, as there was, in his own words, A boycott of Russian schools in Poland, and I did not want to have my first work printed in the Russian language. Indeed, 50 years later, when he discussed his experience of attending the University of Warsaw during the Russian occupation, Sierpinski would recount, I don't know what Ruby just said, but it's pronounced Wacław Sierpiński. I'm sorry, I'm American. I tried my best. We had to attend a yearly lecture on the Russian language. Each of the students made it a point of honor to have the worst result in that subject. I did not answer a single question, and I got an unsatisfactory mark. I passed all my examinations, then the lecturer suggested I should take a repeat examination, Otherwise, I would not be able to obtain the degree of a candidate for mathematical science. I refused him, saying that this would be the first case at our university that someone having excellent marks in all subjects, having the dissertation accepted, and a gold medal, would not obtain the degree of a candidate for mathematical science because of one lower mark in the Russian language. He ultimately graduated, with the low mark intact. After graduating, Sierpinski would go on to have a prolific career in mathematics, publishing over 700 papers and 50 books in his lifetime, all while making considerable contributions to the fields of number theory, set theory, topology, and more stuff that a filthy art major like me knows next to nothing about. Perhaps his most famous contribution to the field, though, are a trio of well-known fractals, appropriately named the Sierpinski curve, the Sierpinski carpet, and, the relevant one we'll actually examine, the Sierpinski Triangle. The Sierpinski Triangle is an equilateral triangle that is recursively subdivided into an ever smaller series of smaller triangles, on and on, recurring inward, forever moving away from its original source as it creates identical replicas of itself for eternity. You may recognize this pattern, both because its most basic form is the iconic Triforce, but, more importantly, because it's the logo of the Sierpinski Station. It's one of the most famous pieces of geometry in modern times, right up there with the Penrose Triangle, a tri-bar shape that looks like a typical object with a beginning, middle, and end, but can become an impossible shape when viewed from the proper angle. Oh hey, I know you! All right, let's begin untangling the story the right way. So, now that we've given a full play-by-play -play of the narrative, as well as one possible reading on what it means, which I overwhelmingly disagree with, let's double back one more time, in the spirit of recursion and cycles, and see if we can't put these puzzle pieces in order. With that said, here's what I'm seeing. Space imperialism, aka the Empire of Usan, carries humanity to the stars, but eventually breaks off into a revolutionary war between them and the Space Soviets, aka the Usan Nation, which itself quickly descends into totalitarian control of its citizens under the pretense of fighting for their freedom. The main front of this war quickly materializes on Veneta, the nation's rechristened name for Earth where the two sides proceed to effectively destroy the planet and its climate in an attempt to claim it as their own. It's here that Alina So is originally stationed as part of the People's Army, 5th Venetian Infantry Division, Unit 12, alongside an unnamed soldier we're going to call Lilith Atoy. 
in time, the war on Veneta begins to reach a stalemate, but not before Lilith is killed in action. Around that same time, though, her personality begins to be used by the nation as the baseline template for their land survey ship technician replicas. A model specifically made with the intent of being flung out into space to most likely die alone. We know this broadly because the classified documents plainly admit that her persona was copied from a soldier from Veneta, and Ariane notes that Elster has a Venetan accent. Additionally, we know it's Lilith in particular because of the flashbacks to the Venetan War and the fake-out ending, which includes her remembering the full picture of Lilith and Alina before we ever see it, as well as the broken moon which is out of frame in the photo, but also includes a shot of Lilith wounded in the trenches. On top of this, as you've probably noticed by now, we also see this image of Lilith with an eye wound in an exact retracing of the shot we see when Elster later gets her own eye stabbed out. Again, we can't know for sure what this woman's name is, but whoever she is, this person is Elster's Gestalt, and that Gestalt clearly knew Alina. With this experienced soldier in hand, and the technology needed to replicate her, the nation began putting their plans into action. Having a strong grasp on most of the Outer Rim planets, they almost certainly sought to increase their holdings for much needed resources and space. This was the beginning of the Penrose Program. Shortly after it starts, a bullied student from one of Jupiter's moons with immense but unrealized bioresonant abilities chooses to take her chances in the isolation of space over a life of forced mining beneath a re-education facility on Pluto. They, of course, didn't tell her the whole plan. When the ship begins to fail ten years later, the LSTR unit dies first. Ariane, now desperate for death but unwilling to do it herself, puts herself in the cryopod for what she expects to be the final time. Except it isn't. Somewhere, far beyond the Oort Cloud, the ship crashes onto a planet. This awakens Ariane who makes the choice to take one of the spacesuits and feel solid ground, and perhaps the wind, one last time. And out there, she finds... something. Could be an alien, could be a machine god, could be the right eye, could be the king in yellow. Doesn't matter, because whatever it is, it becomes one with Ariane, fusing with her and amplifying her latent bioresonance to turn her into a being with godlike powers. The entity we see in the artifact ending. The Red Eye. From there, she immediately uses her newfound abilities to reconstruct reality and make this right. She does what she can to fix the Penrose, and resurrects Elster. Or, alternatively, bestow her with a new body. Elster awakens and heads out to find her but only discovers the hole, and Ariane's recreation of her old room that she left behind. And here, she sees a copy of an old book that Ariane had found in the Atoy's bookstore, waiting for her, sealed with the plates that lead to the gate outside nowhere. The moment we pick it up is when everything truly begins. The pair finally meet again. The sheer intensity of Ariane's new power burning off Elster's synthetic flesh the moment she begins to speak to her directly, eventually killing her body and absorbing her mind once she appears in fold to tell her to remember our promise. What might get overlooked, though, is that we also see Issa, the only other surviving character who we know has interacted with the King in Yellow, holding a knife to her hand, before we are shown blood hitting a runicated tesseract symbol on the ground, the same symbol which we later find inside a copy of The King in Yellow, as well as Falk, as well as the title screen. Perhaps, then, this is what summons Ariane, as the Red Eye, back to Lang, where Falk finds her. Falk, an immensely powerful bioresonant, becomes infected with both Ariane and Elster's mind, becoming a gestalt of them both. 
everything ranging from their love to fear to insecurity to hope. And this is when the disease, Falcon Ariane's bioresonant distorting of reality, begins to set in. So, here's a question. Why do we never see an infected LSTR unit? There's literal piles of Elster corpses all around, yet not a single one of them is infected in the way that every other model becomes. Why? Honest answer is, we don't know. However, my answer is this. Ariane's bioresonance reaches out, looking for replicas it can copy Elster onto. The compatible units, the LSTR units, become new incarnations of her Elster. Or, alternatively, every single LSTR unit in existence has had their persona copied from the LSTR on Penrose 512. Meaning that the moment they wake up, they instinctively start looking for their partners. From there, she tries to find Alina. Or was it Ariane? Or was it Alina? For Elster, with the memories of Ariane fresh in her mind, alongside her life as Lilith lingering just under the surface, it probably doesn't matter much. Or, more accurately, it matters just as much either way. Which brings us to the next question that naturally follows. What of the Gestalts? Well, same thing. Those compatible by nature of their similar builds are having their consciousness replaced as well. Namely, Alina So, who we see gradually transform into a reincarnation of Ariane over the course of her diary entries, culminating in the lowest depths of Serpinski. This, right here, is why I think all of the various references in this game aren't just there because, oh hey, cool reference, but are done deliberately to inspire a specific emotional response. A distant sense of familiarity when seeing something unfamiliar for the first time. If someone would like to lob the critique that Rose Engine employs too many references, I wouldn't exactly disagree. Especially in certain places, really. We're just going to call it nowhere, huh? Fucking Christ, dude. But, also, after looking at this game for as long as we have, I think it's safe to say that the duo which make up this studio aren't stupid, nor are they lacking in originality. They had to have known that critique would get pulled out against them, and they had the skills available to them to avoid it, but deliberately decided it was worth risking for the emotional impact it would have. Because, in the face of the apathy held by the state and the universe, everything and everyone is replaceable. Everyone and everything is interchangeable. Everyone and everything can be copied into a simulacra of itself, which gives the impression of what it once was, but ultimately finds an entirely new life and meaning. Are the arm shattering and clone image shots homages to Ghost in the Shell and Evangelion? Rip-offs if you want to be harsh? Yes, but they have completely new meanings, utterly removed from their sources. Because art is no more special than key cards or robots or people. The souls of these images are the same, but their feelings and experiences are completely unique. They're replicas. With that established, let's double back to Alina, which is to say, Ariane. Alina's deterioration into effectively being a replica of Ariane is why she suddenly reappears in the flesh after the fakeout ending. Another thing from the fakeout ending that I think is important to hone in on are the shots where we see the characters' models. First, we see Alina's name said, and one person turns in response, as we'd expect. Elster's name gets said, and they all turn, one after another, as though they're all Elster, but different incarnations of her. Then last, and most importantly, Ariane's name gets said, and all the people turn at once, including both Alina and Falk. 
This is part of the reason why I don't think it's any mistake that every image we see of Ariane prior to the Penrose crash shows her sporting short hair, even 3,000 cycles into her journey. The moment we find her on Lang, though, she suddenly has the exact same hair and bandages as Alina. Likewise, every image we see of Alina from her time on Veneta shows her with brown hair. Once she's on Lang, however, her hair is suddenly shifting towards a shade of white. They become one in the same. All of this is also why the final chapter of this game suddenly pivots from being centered around the memories of Alina, the memories of Adler, the memories of Falk, and suddenly shifts into being the memories of the most important place to Ariane and Issa. Let's talk about Issa again, one last time. So, here's another question for you. Why do the only Gestalt uniforms we find in Serpinski look like this? Follow-up question, why is Issa wearing this uniform instead? For double points, why is Erica wearing the exact same thing when we find her portrait, while we never see Alina wearing the same thing? Bonus question, did you notice that Issa has a fresh knife-shaped cut on her hand? Final question, on the shrine which is seemingly constructed from Ariane's personal memories, the shrine which causes Issa to finally accept that she'll never accomplish her goal, on this shrine where we find the death card and Erica's portrait, why is there also a portrait of Issa? Oh hey, the rot starts with the hand that had the cut, I wonder if that means anything! I'll spell it out. Issa and Erica found the king in yellow. The book got confiscated, Erica got taken away, Issa performed a ritual that she remembered from the book. What this did exactly, we'll never know. But. For practical purposes, I'd say it led one way or another to the death of her body, while her mind and memories joined the entity tied to the King in Yellow. The same entity that Ariane eventually found and fused with. Without the bioresonant powers though, she had no means of maintaining her sense of reality, let alone controlling any of this. Issa was dead before Ariane ever boarded the Penrose. And because time and memory is arbitrary nonsense, her ritual meant she ended up at Serpinski, wearing her school uniform, holding the same knife she performed the ritual with, and no knowledge of what happened to her sister. Her childhood schoolmate Ariane knows, though. The Red Eye knows. Now seems like the perfect time. In case you haven't noticed, the Red Eye follows us absolutely everywhere. From the cameras that trace us through every room they're in, to watching us through TVs, to literally fucking saving the game. When Elster finds the room in the prologue, she is perfectly fine until the moment the monitor shifts to red. And that is when reality begins to burn her away. We are always in its view. Is the Red Eye also the storm on the surface of Jupiter that the denizens of Rotfront came to view as a symbol for state surveillance? Yes, of course. You know who would have internalized that symbolism? A girl who grew up on Rotfront and felt the state's scornful eyes on her at all times. A girl who, herself, has red eyes. Ariane is the Red Eye. Did you notice that Ariane's mom is named Iris? Why is the shining carpet everywhere? Is it just asset reuse, or is it there because it has a red eye too? Does this have anything to do with the fact that none of the replicas have feet? I am being so fucking normal. The flesh plates we collect in Nowhere, which also seal the King in Yellow shut, also correspond to each of the six celestial bodies that humanity has occupied, which in turn connect to the tarot cards. It also does not escape my notice there are six major levels of the Serpinski facility. That probably means something. I don't know. If you're responsible for my medication, please return my calls. Falk! We already kind of went over. She's basically a fusion of Elster and Ariane and all the trauma and misery that would entail. We know this because she says explicitly in her diary that she's become Elster, but also these shots of Falk and Ariane are so identical that I literally used it for the thumbnail. They are the same goddamn person. Plus her musical theme is literally just Ariane's theme, reversed.
also, like, you know, if you needed more proof there's some Ariane in the mix despite her flatly saying she's becoming Elster, there you go. Anything else I could say would just be repeating Haley's analysis. This is actually one of the areas where I mostly agree with her. And Adler is just kind of caught in the middle of all of this. We know that he too was likely a native of Rotfront named Nikolai Wynn, who possibly suffered from the same social difficulty and love of artistry that Ariane struggled with. Regardless of whether or not his gestalt was Nikolai, however, we do know that his gestalt gave Ariane a test for bioresonance. A test that we know ultimately failed to detect Ariane's abilities. Or, perhaps, that succeeded. Which marked her as the kind of threat they'd be best off catapulting into deep space. It is implied that Ariane's latent abilities are potentially strong enough that they'd put her on par with the Empress of the Empire. A person whose bioresonance is so powerful that it allowed her to create replicas in the first place. Plus, it's not like Adler is exactly opposed to killing women who shouldn't be here. I don't know. That's just my headcanon anyways. As an Adler unit, he's most certainly not a soldier or a fighter in the way that everyone else is. In every fight he has, he gets his shit wrecked. They aren't fighters. They're subordinate middle managers, literally designed from the ground up to serve Falk units. All of this to say that I can't help but see Adler as a dark foil to Elster more than anything else. Elster's drive to do what she can for Ariane is literally self-destructive, but it is ultimately something she wants of her own volition. Adler, though, has always given everything to Falk, because he was built for that specific purpose. He is weak to bioresonance for this exact reason. Through this lens, it's easy to see that he is responsible for maintaining the status quo by any means necessary. In this way, I see Adler as effectively being a stand-in for the nation itself as a stand-in for the entity that is ultimately responsible for every single death we see in this game. Which, at last, brings us to the endings. For a game that otherwise revels in being obtuse as all hell, most of these endings are pretty much what they say on the tin. You either abandon your promise and leave, or you stay and find Alina as Ariane, who in turn has either forgotten you probably because she's still mostly Alina, or she remembers and you fulfill your promise. As for which one is the best ending, well, I'm kind of partial to memory because it's at least something approaching a moment of calm in this nightmarish storm. I think they deserve that, be they Ariane and Elster or Alina and Lilith. That said, with all love and respect to Salmatol, I do feel that calling the leave ending anything other than heart-crushingly bleak is the kind of thing you should only admit to your therapist. Just dying in the middle of the desert after failing to fulfill my final promise to my lover. I'm glad this is happening, actually. It's called subjectivity and art, Ruby. Fuck you! Ultimately, though, I don't think which ending you get matters much. The fates that befall the couple in all of the normal endings are more or less equivalent. Which is to say, they all leave the cycle to continue repeating on and on, forever, with no end in sight. Hell, to even call these endings feels like a misnomer, like I'm lying to you by describing them as such. It's like calling the mouth and tail of an Ouroboros the ending. Technically true, but the self-boring continues unceasingly. If there is any hope to be found at all though, it is almost certainly in the artifact ending, which is very difficult to make sense of. And very easy to simply project what you want to be true onto the abstract canvas it provides. That said, there are objective clues about what's happening here. The floor is the same as the fleshy ground of nowhere, and the room where we normally would have fought Falk. There are what seem to be six Elsters, though some of them have armor colors very different from anything else we see in-game. We also see the six pillars earlier in those flashbacks from Elster's Gestalt memories, which itself bears a striking resemblance to the shot of the Mushroom Cloud. 
meaning it's possibly a monument to its victims. But either way, it does prove that these pillars predate the Penrose. And the symbol in the center of the six pillars resembles the game's logo. Runicated Tesseract and all that. Which we know to be a symbol related to the King in Yellow, and Falk. Additionally, I think the keys themselves do a fair amount to give context to the ending. The Key of Love foreshadows the dancing. Eternity foreshadows that it will still not exactly be happy, and is arguably the red eye talking to us directly. And Sacrifice conjures the image of mushroom clouds and state-endorsed crimes against humanity. The Lily and its pod appear over the course of the game, often in locations that have been of great solace to Ariane. The one in the safe, though, is an obvious reference to the mask in The King in Yellow. The story where a girl who seemed doomed to remain frozen for eternity had had her recovery foreshadowed by a lily. Hope you remember that from two hours ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Two and a half. This video became so much more than I wanted it to be, dude. For a story that is so reliant on references to get across what it's trying to say, I think it's safe to say this infers there's at least a little bit of happiness and relief to be found here. Especially considering the text that accompanies it. A friend who's well-versed in German tells me that the two quotes that flash up on screen translate as, And in those days, people will look for the two, and not find them. And, The mystery of this god is complete, as she announced it to our servants, the prophets. Which certainly makes this seem like a definitive ending that breaks the cycle. And then there's the red eye that looms over the Penrose, which I've already given my thoughts on. One thing I will note, though, is the shot order. We see the red eye. Then we see a final call to remember our promise. Then we see the dancing. You know, we never actually find out what the promise was. Everyone likes to assume it was killing Ariane, and like, yeah, lots of evidence for that. Very easy to infer. But it also could have been to dance one more time. Whatever the Red Eye is, it clearly knows about the promise, and clearly has the power to manifest it. But this is what it chose to give us. Just saying. Something to think about. There's a lot of potential reads on this, as we've already seen. If someone wanted to make the case that this is just a form of acceptance for the pair before they die proper, or a final denial of reality before falling into the delusion for eternity, or any other reading, I can't say I disagree. But, for my part, if we accept that Ariane is the Red Eye, and that the physical Ariane we find is a converted Alina, then, well, why wouldn't the Red Eye give them the ending it always wanted, no matter how bittersweet and impossibly distant she will forever remain? They will never dance again. That doesn't mean the dancing can't continue. And therein lies the heart of Signalis. We might be doomed by the narrative, both literal and political. The loves which blossom out of coping with bleak destiny may not be enough to safeguard ourselves from the cruelty enacted on us by those with the power to do so. It is, in fact, very possible we might just flatly lose. So we try again. And again. And again, and again, for as long as we're able to. In doing so, there's a chance we'll arrive to the same conclusion, or worse, precisely repeat the cycle all over. But there's always just as much reason to believe that we can discover something obscured, something completely unforeseeable, something that allows us to move beyond the cycle. We will never find it, though. If we do not try, again and again, no matter how absurd or Sisyphean it might seem, as long as the world's intact and we're still breathing, we can never stop trying. Because in dire circumstances like these, that's ultimately all we have, outside of each other. All we can do is try again. Art is subjective. 
wouldn't you agree? It should be obvious by this stage that the story this game is trying to tell is, shall we say, slippery. As evidenced by the fact that Somato and I had radically different interpretations of it, and if you played this game before getting here, there's a solid chance you just spent the last hour repeatedly muttering to yourself, yeah, I don't know about that. And that's good! Memes aside, I do not think my read on this is in fact the correct one. Just the one that feels true to me. And I hope that you find one that feels true to you as well. Hell, this is part of why I went through the effort of giving such a thorough summary. Not just because I feel it was needed to lay out the foundations of our own reading, though it was, but because we wanted to do our best to give you the means to have your own take on everything, with the same amount of context we've discovered after the fact. And for those of you who have managed to find a reading of your own, then please, by all means, leave it down in the comments below, as we would absolutely love to hear your thoughts on what's happening here. Because I would argue that everyone being able to come up with their own unique reading of Signalis is, indeed, part of the point. This is a story told in such a way that it starts to become a bit of a Rorschach test. A dream we're expected to half-remember as we fill in gaps with personal assumptions. A private study in pareidolia. By nature of just how much info this game overwhelms its players with, especially the ones who try and stare at it for, say, I don't know, over two and a half fucking hours as they try and make sense of it. It's inevitable we'll end up working to separate signal from noise. Even my reading, comprehensive as it is, leaves a lot of seemingly important elements on the floor. I didn't even talk about the goddamn flesh, which is also definitely Ariane, but this has already gone on long enough. I, I, I can't, I can't, I can't. We will find the patterns important to us and leave behind that which isn't. And I think that is, in fact, how we're meant to interact with Signalis. The big thing I think that's worth focusing on here is not the diverging interpretations of my reading and Salmatol's, nor anyone else's for that matter. That's to be expected. Signalis is, if nothing else, an expressionist work. A work that's much more invested in communicating its narrative by way of the emotions it evokes, more than just the literal written word. As a matter of fact, Real quick, let's just... Lee Krasner was an American abstract expressionist painter, born in 1900. No! no! Ruby, this video is already longer than the Holy Mountain! And I wasn't allowed to go on tangents or asides. Don't you remember our promise? Fine! God! Discussion for another time. So, with that vetoed, I'll instead say this. Hypocritical though it might be. To get to the heart of what this game is actually trying to say, instead of getting too fixated on the minutiae and mechanics of plot and lore, I think it'd be best to hone in on the emotional overlaps all of these readings seem to share. Because this game isn't about trying to figure out whether or not the couple was able to finally reunite, but rather all the feelings it evokes up until that moment. So what are those? Well. Having looked at my own reading, Haley's, a sacrilegious amount of Reddit posts, and basically every video essay live on this godforsaken website, there are some undeniable through lines that seemingly everyone agrees on. The anxiety that we face when oppressive cultures and governing bodies stare down at us and force us to conform under the threat of violence. The pain that they put us through to enforce that conformity. The looming existential fear that we, as individuals, are interchangeable and replaceable. The grief of having our identities dissolved and subsumed into a greater, unrecognizable collective. The resentment, the unrestrained anger against the society that facilitates that pain. The frustration inherent to inescapable cycles of suffering. The soul-crushing hopelessness of being unable to fight against our fate. That, try as we might, we're just shoved into situations we can never get out of. That we're just victims of circumstance. The love that still manages to blossom despite all of that. As strong as Ariane's lilies. The anguish at seeing that love blow away, like ashes taken from us as our loved ones' bodies falter 
and fail. That we have to watch it all burn up. The fury at knowing that it didn't have to be that way. The drive to make it right. By any means necessary. No matter what. I made a promise. I'll do anything. These feelings are, at heart, what actually make up Signalis. The fact that no matter what reading anyone has on the specific events which make up this game's story, that these feelings are almost universally the ones that bubble to the top for those who play it, is why this game is genius. It's also why, if you've watched this far in, I'm going to say you are now legally required to play this game yourself. This is not a request. You owe it to both me, Salmatol, Rose Engine, and, most importantly, yourself, to play the game of the year for 2022 and have your own personal take on it that I'm sure I will violently disagree with. This is also why, if you're not totally signalist out, you should absolutely go watch all of these videos too, because they are all incredible but unique reads on this material that I cannot recommend enough. I'd call Signalis a magnum opus if I wasn't also convinced that Rose Engine can still do better. I know talent when I see it. Sky's the limit, really. With that said, I know they're a small studio, and I've seen them tweet about readings of the game, so in the very real event that Babs and Yuri happen to watch this, first off, hi. Thank you for the incredible game. Very worth the price I paid for it. Secondly, apologies for almost certainly butchering your lore. I promise I tried really goddamn hard. Third, I'm sending you a bill for the damage done by the brainworms this game gave me. And most importantly, thank you for giving me a piece of art that I can see myself in. No matter what either of you do in future, I promise I'll be there to see it. As for the rest of you, please, allow me to leave you with one last reading. 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 Word. Fuck, yeah, no, I'm done. <laughs> I went into a field of flowers whose petals are whiter than snow and whose hearts are pure gold. Far afield, a woman cried, I have killed her I loved, and from a jar, she poured blood upon the flowers whose petals are whiter than snow and whose hearts are pure gold. Far afield I followed, and on the jar I read a thousand names, while from within the fresh blood bubbled to the brim. I have killed her I loved, she cried. The world's a thirst, now let it drink. She passed, and far afield I watched her, pouring blood upon the flowers whose petals are whiter than snow and whose hearts are pure gold. The king in yellow, the prophet's paradise, the sacrifice. Hey there. This is the voice of Solmatol, entirely now divorced from my feeble replica body and by resonancing my consciousness across the universe directly into your brain. Due to aforementioned circumstances, Codex is currently loading all of her stuff into a Penrose U-Haul ship and moving back across the country, leaving me to give y'all the final wrap up for this video. If you've watched this far, myself and Ruby want to say thank you. Sincerely. This video game has been a wild ride to pick apart and I'm glad that you all accompanied us. If you'd like to see more content wherein she picks apart beautifully written, complex video games, please be sure to hit that little like button and maybe even subscribe and hit the bell. You can even support the channel and the work that she does by hopping over to Patreon if you're able. Links are in the description below. All of these things help out the channel immensely and they are genuinely deeply appreciated. On Ruby's behalf, I'd like to give a huge thank you to everyone that helped out with this project, including all the voice actors that contributed, including Nesmi Fie as Alina, Honeybat as the Star Unit, Jam Jam Jambling as the Rot Front Documents, Ajax as Adler, Playhead North as Issa, Last Minute Essays as Sierpinski, Ragnarox as the Yusan Nation, Han Petty as Beo, Clark Bacalso as Ariane, and oh hey, it's me, Salmatol, as Elster. And most importantly, 
a huge special thank you shout out to our wonderful patrons, including Alex Shemp, Black Mage AP, RK Opter Riggedy, Dr. Haley Isabella Coley, Patrick Salisbury, Spencer Burton, Phoenix, Christopher Moore, Ashamed Spork, Jeanette Ng, Sunny Side Up, Lilith Luna Lovecraft, Joseph Rasmussen, Scarlet Booth, Dartelius Rayard, Aldrich underscore Kool Aid, Mary Koser, Honey Rust, Daragas, Moth, Random Key Sin, Sum Moose, CK Noir, Taylor Thomas, Shibe, Liliana, Crushable Door, Leon de Bauer, Brody Bones, Ida, Cloud, and Matthew Cassidy, and everyone else that is helping out over on Patreon. Thank you so, so much. If you'd like to help support the channel, please do consider hopping on over there and pledging what you can. Benefits include some behind the scenes looks at future video projects, and with any luck, we'll also have a new video on some wild theatre history out shortly too. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Don't forget to tell someone that you love them. Remember your promises. Do right by each other. Bye-bye.